Hello, beautiful souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn, and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. I just want to say thank you to all my returning subscribers, and if you're new here, it is nice to meet you. So let's get right into today's story. Today's story is about Scott Lee Kimball, also known as Hannibal Kimball. This story is absolutely unbelievable. If this was a movie I was watching, I would think there's absolutely no way that any of this would ever happen in real life. But this very much is a true story. Kimball was born in 1966 in Boulder, Colorado. His parents got divorced when he was 10 years old. So when he was 10 years old and the parents divorced, his father moved away and got remarried. And him and his younger brother stayed and lived with his mother. Kimball had a really hard time with the divorce and he started getting in trouble with the police at quite a young age. His first incident with the police he took a gun and shot it out his window at his neighbor's house. Now, nobody was hurt, but obviously you can't have kids shooting guns out of windows. For this, he never got charged or got put in any kind of juvenile facility. It was just his first encounter with police. And I think they pretty much just told him like, yeah, you can't shoot guns out windows. You're a kid. Why are you shooting a gun? And that was the end of it. But it is a trend in this story that Kimball will commit crime after crime after crime and police never really do anything about it. So Kimball was not very happy living at home with his mother. So he used to spend quite a lot of time at his grandmother's house. One of the grandmother's neighbors started taking an interest in Kimball and his younger brother and he would invite them over to his house. And he did not have good intentions. Both Kimball and his younger brother were essayed by this man. And the man told both of the boys, if you tell anyone about this abuse, I'll kill your father. So Kimball and his brother kept quiet about this abuse for an extremely long time. And all abuse obviously is horrible, but the abuse that Kimball and his brother were suffering was extremely violent and all of it was videotaped. Kimball, trying to get away from the abuse that he was suffering, he went to live with his father in Hamilton, Montana, and this is where he would live while he attended high school. But just because Kimball had moved away, the abuse didn't stop because Kimball and his younger brother would still go and visit his mother and grandmother on the weekends and the abuse continued with the neighbor. The abuse would continue until Kimball was 23 years old. And when Kimball was 23 years old, he attempted to unalive himself by this and this is when the abuse stopped. When he had shot himself, he was in very critical condition, but he did survive, obviously, because the story continues. And long after Kimmel gets caught for all of his crimes, his cousin was interviewed and the cousin said that as a result of this attempt at unaliving, he believed that it had drastically changed Kimball and he believed that he no longer had a conscience after he had done this. So we have abuse and a head injury and in true crime, you know as well as I do, never a good combination and we're definitely not going to a good place. Once Kimball recovered, him and a bunch of other boys that had been essayed by this man went to the police and he was arrested and put in prison. 
And at this time, Kimball had already started committing crimes. They were nonviolent crimes at this time. He was charged with passing bad checks in Montana. For this, he was convicted as a felon. Kimball was also burglarizing homes in Colorado. Kimball then moved to Spokane, Washington, and in 1993, he had a brief marriage in which they had two sons. The wife said that during their marriage, Kimball would have a lot of other criminals at their house where they would be working out scams and ways to steal money, and there was just always a lot of people connected to crime in their home. Kimball and his ex-wife continued to see each other for two years after their divorce. They stopped seeing each other when Kimball R-worded his ex-wife. So obviously the wife goes to the police to report this, but the police decide they're not going to press charges. They're not even going to investigate, to be honest, because it's too complicated. Too complicated? The following year in 2000, Kimball had violated his probation, so he was sent back to prison in Montana. He then got out of prison after a short time and he was staying in a halfway house. Then he stole money and stole a truck from his employer, drove to his ex-wife's house, kidnapped her and R-worded her again. And obviously she goes to the police to report this. And the police are like, okay, yeah, I think this time we're gonna do our job. So we're gonna arrest him because he's committed a crime just like the first time. So they arrest him, he gets out on bail and they plan to obviously go through a trial and convict him of these crimes. But if you're assuming there's gonna be any justice here, you're wrong, no. Kimball fled to Alaska and that was the end of anything that the police were gonna do for the kidnapping and R-wording charges against him. They're like, mm, he's gone to Alaska, what are we gonna do? And yeah, he just went to Alaska and the police never pursued it any further. So yeah, a great job on that one. When Kimball fled to Alaska, he pretended to be his brother. He got engaged and he continued his check fraud schemes and he ended up writing $25,000 in bad checks. So for the bad checks, they decide, yeah, we're going to arrest him, we're going to try him, and we're going to put him in prison. Stealing money, that is a legitimate reason to do our job. The whole kidnapping, R-wording the ex-wife, that was a lot of work that we weren't really that interested in. But stealing money, oh yeah, we're going to take that serious. So he goes to prison. While he's in prison he is able to convince the FBI that he should be a paid informant. And the FBI is like, let's sign him up. Now, normally, if someone's gonna be hired as an FBI paid informant, you would probably check their criminal record. And if the FBI had checked his criminal record at this time, they would know he had an outstanding warrant for what he had done to his ex-wife, but that just never happened. So he is now a paid FBI informant. And the FBI's were just fools in this whole story. They fell for a whole bunch of nonsense. He ended up getting away with a whole bunch of crimes because he's this FBI paid informant. Like the whole thing is just a hot mess, just to let you know what's coming. Following his 2002 release, he decided that he was going to start a beef distribution company. 
and he was given $65,000 by his mother and his brother. Now, who on earth would think giving this man was a good idea? I don't know. Apparently his mother and his brother. At this time, the FBI also made their first payment to him on an installment and they gave him $50,000. Your tax dollars at work. So while Kimball was in prison, he went up to his other inmate and he's like hey you want to make an escape plan the other inmate's like yeah sounds great so the two of them come up with this escape plan and part of the escape plan is that they're going to have the other inmate's girlfriend help them so her name is leanne emery so the inmate that kimball is planning this escape with calls leanne and tells her if kimball needs anything help him and do whatever he tells you to do because we're going to escape. What does Kimball do? He goes to the FBI and tells them that the other inmate is trying to escape. Obviously, he conveniently leaves out of this part of the plan that he was involved. So the inmate gets sent to solitary confinement. The inmate is sent to solitary confinement, so he obviously can't call his girlfriend and tell her anything. And it's not like before they put you in solitary confinement, they're like, oh, did you, you know, want to make a quick phone call before we, you know, uh, put you in solitary? No, they just take you there and lock you up. So the girlfriend has no idea that he's in solitary confinement and he has no idea he's in solitary confinement because of Kimball. So Kimball now has a situation where as soon as he gets out of prison, he has this woman, Leanne, who has been told by her boyfriend to do whatever Kimball tells her to do. And he also has the added bonus of he's now given this information to the FBI. So he's working the deal with them and building this paid informant ruse, nonsense, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. In 2002, when Kimball gets out of prison, he contacts Leanne and she lives in Colorado. Leanne had had a pretty hard life. She was 24 at this time and she was very much involved with people doing drugs and committing crimes. And so when Kimball came along, he fit right into her life. On January 16th, 2003, Leanne goes to her parents' house and she packs up all of her stuff and she tells her parents that she's going to Mexico to go caving, which I guess is you go and look at caves or you, I've always heard it as spelunking. I don't know what exactly the difference between spelunking or caving is, but anyways, she's going to Mexico to crawl through some caves. That's her plan and that's what she tells her parents. Shortly after she left, she called her sister and told her sister, if anything happens to me, please remember that I love you. So it seems like she was willing to go with Kimball, but she obviously must have had some concerns about her safety. Instead of going to Mexico, Leanne and Kimball travel around to four different states stealing checks worth $15,000. They regularly charged gas on Leanne's credit card. So there was a paper trail showing that she had never left the United States. And when there's a paper trail, people be trailing that paper. Kimball would later confess on January 29th, him and Leanne drove out to some cliffs in Utah. He told her to strip naked and then he shot and killed her. The gun he used to kill her was a gun she had bought for him a few days earlier. So she bought him a gun and then he used 
the gun she bought him to take her life. <sighs> Kimball then abandoned her car 40 miles from Grand Junction. And at this time, obviously, Leanne's parents, they don't know that their daughter has been murdered. So after they don't hear from her for a while, they contact the police to report her missing. And the police aren't interested. They won't file a missing person report or do anything at all. So with the police completely unwilling to do anything to try to find Leanne, her family starts trying to investigate this themselves. The first thing they do is they get her records for her credit card. So once they get the credit card records, they can see she never left the United States. And they can also see that the card is still being used in California. The family is able to actually get a copy of the actual signed piece of paper because way back in the day, if you don't know, if you're too young, you didn't just put a car, your credit card in the machine and put your code and leave. You would actually have to sign your name each time you use your credit card. So when they get a copy of the signature, they clearly see it's not Leanne's signature. Leanne is not the person using the credit card. So they decide, let's tell the police about this. Now we must get the police's attention at this point, right? No. No. No, 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 no. No. Nope. Police, they still don't care. They don't investigate or open a missing person or I don't know anything. They're just not interested as happens so many times in the story. So in 2002, when Kimball was still in prison, he was planning other shit with another inmate. So what the plan in this situation was, he was going to get out of prison and he was going to kill a witness that was supposedly going to testify in the trial of this other inmate. So the inmate puts Kimball in contact with his girlfriend, Jennifer McComb. And the plan is, is that Jennifer is supposed to introduce Kimball to the inmate's partner, who is then going to give Kimball a gun so that Kimball can use that gun to kill the person that was going to testify against the guy in prison. Jennifer had also had a hard life. She was living in Denver and she was working as a dancer to support herself and her four-year-old son. Kimball told Jennifer that he owned a bunch of coffee shops in Seattle and if she wanted, she could move to Seattle with him. She could manage one of the coffee shops and this would provide a much better job and situation for her and her son. So Jennifer contacts her boyfriend who's in prison and tells him about Kimball's offer. And the inmates is, says to her, well, that sounds like a great idea. You should definitely go with him to Seattle. Sounds like a good opportunity. And that would be the last time anyone would ever hear from Jennifer other than Kimball. And just to let you know, this whole time, Kimball is still working as a paid FBI informant who are supposedly keeping an eye on him. Somebody's not doing a very good job. And the FBI agent who's supposed to be keeping an eye on Kimball, he's keeping an eye on him. He's just not doing anything about it. He later testifies that the time when Jennifer went missing both Jennifer and Kimball's cell phones went silent. Kimball's phone did not come back on for three days and Jennifer's phone never came back on. Jennifer's car was found abandoned at Denver International Airport and her family obviously cannot get a hold of her and she hasn't contacted her son, which is causing a lot of alarm for her family and friends. 
Kimball claims the last time that he saw Jennifer, she was on her way to Denver airport to take a flight. But when they checked the records, she never took a flight anywhere. And she had never even booked a flight to go anywhere. Then Kimball tells the FBI that he knows she was killed and gives them no further information and nobody looks into it. Like how many times in this video am I gonna say nobody looked into it? A lot, because it continues. Jennifer's father had a friend who worked at a police department. So he contacted his friend and he said, my daughter's missing, nobody will help me look for her, can you help me? So his friend is like, yeah, I'll definitely, you know, look into it, see what I can find out. So when he starts looking into her disappearance, the FBI gets alerted. So the FBI agent calls Jennifer's dad. He calls Jennifer's dad and gives Jennifer's dad Kimball's phone number. He tells him to call Kimball, ask for Joe Snitch, and that's it. The FBI, the police, they're not contacting Kimball. The missing woman's father is told to call Kimball. I, like, ugh. it's so confusing and it gets even worse. It gets even worse. So when Jennifer's dad calls Kimball, they plan to meet up. Jennifer's parents and Kimball are gonna get together and have a meeting about Jennifer's disappearance. Are there gonna be any police officers or FBI involved in this meeting? Absolutely not. It's just her parents and Kimball who are just going to meet to discuss this. No sense. I don't, uh, no sense. So Kimball and Jennifer's parents meet for lunch and Kimball tells Jennifer's dad that Jennifer was killed and Kimball can take them to her body. So Jennifer's parents are divorced. So they're staying at a motel and the dad and the mom, they have separate rooms and Kimball, I don't know if he had a room or he just came into town or what's up with Kimball. But that night, Kimball goes to the mother's motel room. He knocks on the door and he tells the mother, if you sign a contract, let me tie you up and have sex with you. I will tell you how your daughter was killed. Obviously the mother declines the offer and contacts the police to let them know what has happened. What do the police do? Absolutely nothing. This man has told her parents that they can lead them to her body. He knows the physical location of her body and they've asked the mom to sign a contract and have sex with him and the police do nothing. They don't even follow up on it. They don't even ask Kimball about it. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I know I must sound so frustrated because I am like it's it's normal that there's going to be situations where police don't follow up on something they should have or they're going to make mistakes. People are human. But in this case, every single police or FBI agent that Kimball comes in contact with is completely incompetent and he deals with so many different police departments and FBI agents. Like, it's not like he's just dealing with one police department and this one police department didn't do their job. He's all over the goddamn country and nobody is doing anything. And he's just continuing to kill people. Well, I don't know, they twiddle their thumbs? Like, I don't know. Early in January, 2003, Kimball meets a woman named Lori McLeod. 
Kimball tells Lori that he is an FBI agent and he's got a fake badge to show her to prove it. So they decide to go out on their first date on Valentine's Day. And just to kind of keep the timeline going the way it is, when they go on their first date on Valentine's Day, it's very soon after that Jennifer went missing and was killed. So he actually meets Lori before he kills Jennifer. So Lori just be really believes he's an FBI agent. So he can go and disappear for weeks at a time and she thinks he's working. And the only thing he ever told Lori to do with his work was that he was involved in the murder of a woman named Jennifer. Now, obviously Lori's thinking he's the FBI agent looking into the murder. What she doesn't know is no, he's the murderer. Lori is really focused on her daughter, Casey. Casey had been going through a really hard time but she was doing a lot better now. She was living with her mother. She had gotten clean because she had some issues with addiction prior. And she had a job that she was really proud of, that she was had a job, she was going to work, she was making money. So Casey was doing really, really well at this point when Kimball and Lori, Casey's mother, meet. In August, Kimball tells Lori he's going on a hunting trip. While Kimball was supposedly away at his hunting trip, Casey goes missing. She was supposed to show up for a shift at her job and she never showed up to the shift and no one ever heard from her again. So obviously Lori goes to the police to report her daughter missing and the police aren't interested at all. When Kimball supposedly returns to town, he tells Lori he can use his FBI connections to look into Casey's case. So Lori, her mother, is obviously trying to look for her daughter because the police aren't doing anything. Lori, the mother, contacts Casey, the daughter who's missing's boyfriend. And the boyfriend tells Lori that the last time he saw Casey was the day she went missing. And he says that Kimball showed up, picked up Casey in her work uniform, and he has not heard from her since. At this point now, Lori's thinking, is Kimball involved in her disappearance? So Kimball proposes. And Lori accepts. And Kimball somehow says to Lori, if we get married, that might help you move on from Casey being missing. And I'm not sure why we're moving on. I know why Kimball wants to move on, but her daughter's just gone missing. They have no idea what happened to her. Like, why does she need to move on? She doesn't need to move on. She needs to stay focused on looking for her daughter. But obviously, Kimball would like her to move along in that process. Kimball also claims that by them getting married, that might help find Casey. How? Like, how? How, how would them getting married help find Casey like I don't I read that and I don't understand it I, I don't understand even how I don't know I don't know how that works apparently he's convinced that they get married that'll somehow help find her don't know and this part is just so sick and twisted they decide to go on a honeymoon after they get married and Kimball suggests they go camping for their honeymoon. So they're thinking, let's go out in the woods and get freaky for our honeymoon. Where does Kimball take her? He takes her to the forest where later her missing daughter's body would be discovered. So Kimball has killed her daughter left her daughter's body 
in this forest, then marries the mother and takes her on a honeymoon to the same forest where literally her daughter's body is laying and decomposing. And I can't even imagine, because eventually Lori will find out. Obviously, at this time, she's on her honeymoon. She has no idea. But she will later, obviously, find out that she spent her honeymoon very close to where her daughter's body was. And the mind fuck that would be, I can't even imagine. <sighs> like, this man is sick beyond sick. As you can imagine, the marriage is not going well from the beginning. Kimball is away a lot of the time. He's not home very often. And when he is home, he's extremely emotionally abusive to Lori. He's not only abusive to Lori, he's abusive to his two sons. Now, if you remember the first wife, who the one that he kidnapped and R-worded and the police decided to just never look for him to actually take him to trial, he still has visitation with those two boys. So, I mean, the police would be able to know where he is to actually bring him to trial because the mother, who is the victim, knows where her sons go to visit their father. So it's just... So frustrating, so frustrating. So he's not only emotionally abusive to Lori, he's extremely emotionally abusive to his two sons. His oldest son, Justin, seems to be the one that got it the worst. Justin was a very sweet, loving, very kind, gentle boy. And to Kimball, this made him feminine, which was apparently absolutely horrible. And he would constantly tease and ridicule Justin all of the time. And the younger son, Cody, he was emotionally abused as well. He obviously must have gone through an extremely hard time. But in my research, it seems like the focus of his abuse a lot of the time was on Justin, the older son. But I'm sure it was horrible for Cody. I can't imagine being this man's son. One evening in July 2004, Kimball and his two sons are in the backyard digging holes. Why they're digging holes, I don't know. They're just in the backyard digging holes. And all of a sudden, Lori's in the house while uh, Kimball and his sons are digging the holes. And Cody, the youngest son, runs in the house to Lori and says, call 911, Justin's been hurt. So Lori obviously picks up the phone, calls 911, and is trying to get an ambulance. As she's on the phone trying to get an ambulance, she sees Kimball pick up Justin, put him in his car, and drive away. So she obviously tells them, I don't, we don't need an ambulance. My husband's bringing him to the hospital. Because obviously, you know, you have an injured child, you're assuming that if his parent is picking him up, putting him in a car and driving off, he is taking him to the hospital to get help. Um, but there's a few things that happen along the way. When Lori and Cody get to the hospital, Justin's on a gurney and he's in convulsions and there is blood everywhere. What Cody had told Lori was that he thought that Justin had broken his leg. So that was the type of injury Lori's showing up expecting. So when Lori sees him, and how injured he is, she's confused and she asks a nurse, like, what, what's going on? And the nurse said, well, he suffered a lot and has a lot of injuries from the fall. And Lori tells the nurse, I'm not aware of any fall. What do you mean he fell? The nurse tells Lori that when Kimball showed up to the hospital with Justin, he told the nurses and doctors that his son had fallen out of the car while it was driving 60 miles an hour 
and he had also been hit with a steel grate. So how do you explain a child falling out of a car going 60 miles an hour? Well, apparently Justin tried to open the window, but he opened the door instead and just fell out. Just fell right out of the car, all on his own. Oh, guess what? There's life insurance on Justin and guess who the beneficiary is? Kimball. Now, obviously after this incident, the mother finds out about it. She gets rid of the life insurance, but. Mm. So when Justin got to the hospital, he was put in a medically induced coma for two weeks. So for two weeks, nobody could talk to him to ask him any questions or anything like that. But after two weeks, he wakes up. And the very first thing he says when he wakes up is, why did my dad do this to me? That's suspicious. And then the neurosurgeon who was treating him said his memory could have been affected by his injury. So, okay. But the hospital does decide to call the police. And then, I feel like you guys aren't even gonna believe this at this point. So, <sighs> this is hard to say with a straight face. It's, it's so unbelievable. Okay, so there's two injuries that happen, right? He hurts himself in the backyard and then he falls out of the car, obviously on the way to the hospital. These two incidents happen in different jurisdictions. So there's two police departments involved because the incidents have happened in two different jurisdictions. The two police forces can't decide which one of them should investigate this. So they decide no one's going to investigate it because they can't among themselves decide you look into it or I'm going to look into it. No, they're just like, no one's going to look into it because we just don't know. There are two different jurisdictions. I don't know what to do. And nobody looks into it. That's it. That's it. No one looks into it. He attempted to murder his son. And because the police can't get their shit together to decide somebody's got to investigate it, they just don't. And that's it. That's it. No one looks into it. Like at this point, the police are giving zero Fs. Like nobody is giving a single F at all about anything. And it's just, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So while Justin is in the hospital when he's still in his coma, Kimball's uncle, Terry, comes to town with his dogs and a briefcase full of cash, claiming he is there to help look after Cody while Justin is in the hospital. From the minute he arrives, Lori's not happy. Um, he's an alcoholic and he decides that it's appropriate to just walk around the house naked. Um, he's walking around his nephew's home with his wife and child, and he just does not feel the need to clothe himself. And while the uncle's visiting, he's sleeping in Casey's room. Her daughter that's still missing, this weird naked uncle is now sleeping in her room. So the uncle Terry goes to Kimball and he's like, I want to go into business with you. Let's get into this beef business because he's got this beef business going on. The uncle wants to join the business. Now, when the uncle calls his girlfriend and says he wants to go into business with Kimball, his girlfriend is like, uh, hell no, 
you guys have tried to go into business before. Two of you cannot get along. Everything you guys ever try to do together ends up in a disaster. Don't do it. But Terry's like, yep, yeah, I'm going to do it. One day, Lori comes home and the living room furniture is rearranged and their white leather sofa has an enormous stain on it and is now living in the backyard. So Lori says to Kimball, why is our couch in the backyard? And Kimball tells Lori that the dogs, I don't know if I mentioned that the uncle brought dogs with him when he came, but he tells Lori that dogs threw up on the couch. And Lori's like, that, that doesn't make any sense. Then he says, oh, well, my uncle must have thrown up on the couch and blamed it on the dog. And Lori's like, yeah, that doesn't make sense either. What? Like, none of it makes sense. And then Kimball says, well, you know what? We don't even have to worry about it. Terry, he's gone. He won the lottery, he met a stripper, and he moved to Mexico. So we don't have to worry about him anymore. Now, I don't know what happened to his dogs. I could never find that out. Hopefully, they were taken to a shelter and given to a loving family, but I don't know what happens to the dogs. But the uncle is gone. I mean, Lori's happy he's gone, but she's kind of like, what? Okay. And... Just goes with it, I guess. So once the uncle has moved to Mexico, um, his bank starts to notice suspicious activity on his bank account. And Kimball has also used his uncle's name to buy $12,000 worth of cattle or beef. I'm not sure which. I mean, they're the same, but... I don't know, he buys beef or cattle or something. He obviously never pays for it, but he uses the uncle's name to get it, $12,000 worth of beef. The uncle's bank also had found that $23,000 worth of checks had been written from his account. And he's supposedly in Mexico and all of this bank activity is happening in the United States. And the bank obviously suspects Kimball and contacts the police. The police suspect Kimball. They tell the FBI and guess what? Nobody does anything. Nobody cares. He's commit like, nope. No one cares again. And he's still being paid as an FBI informant at this point. Just... Just so you, I, I like to reiterate that in this story because it's crazy. So a year after the uncle went missing, his brother, so the uncle's brother, who is Kimball's father, receives an email that's supposedly from the uncle saying he's in Mexico, he's loving it, and he's never coming back. Then in 2005, Kimball and Lori's marriage falls apart and Kimball moves to Lafayette. In January 2006, an optometrist in Lafayette notices that he didn't receive his bank statement for his business. So he decides he's going to go to the bank and find out what's going on, you know, with his business accounts. So he gets to the bank and the bank looks into it. And they find out in the last three weeks, $83,000 in fake checks have been deposited into the bank account and $53,000 in checks have been written taking money out of the bank account. And the majority of those checks were made payable to Kimball's Beef Distribution Company. Through security footage, they find that it was Kimball who was obviously doing all of this. So police now want to talk to Kimball and he's left the state. They don't know where he is. So they contact Lori to see if somehow she can put them in contact with Kimball or if she has any idea where he would be. 
When they contact Lori, Lori tells them that he's an FBI agent and very quickly determine by the police that, that no, he's, he's not an FBI agent. He is a paid informant, but he's definitely not an FBI agent. So the police become very, very suspicious of Kimball. So this police department starts looking into all of this very seriously. They are told by Lori about Casey, her daughter's disappearance, and the fact that she suspected that Kimball had something to do with her daughter's disappearance. They also learn about the incident where he had attempted to kill Justin, his son. They also contact the FBI and they find out about Jennifer's disappearance. So at this point, the police, when they're going in to investigate Kimball, they're thinking he's a con artist. Now, with all of this information that they're learning, they realize that they think he's a serial killer. So the FBI puts out a warrant for his arrest, but nobody knows where he is. But they get his cell phone number from Lori, and they're able to trace his cell phone to Riverside, California. So then the police are going to the location where he is to try to arrest him. Kimball is super dramatic, and he goes on like a car chase. Then he crashes the car and he's like running down the road trying to get away from the police. So after all his theatrics, three hours later, they're able to actually apprehend and arrest Kimball. So right off the bat, they're able to charge and convict him on some of the smaller fraud charges because they just want to get him in prison. So he can't get away. He's in prison. We know where he is and it gives them time to investigate all the murders. So police end up getting a big break because Lori ends up getting evicted from where she lived, which is the same place where Kimball lived. And Kimball, obviously not that bright, left a whole bunch of evidence behind. So the first thing that the police find is Casey, the daughter who went missing. They find her work uniform, which is what she was wearing when she went missing. They also find documents that prove that he was the one who had sent, remember there was the email from his uncle in Mexico to his dad saying, I'm in Mexico loving life and not coming back. They find evidence to prove that Kimball is the person who sent that email. They also find pictures of Leanne, who was the inmate's girlfriend who went missing at the very beginning of the story. During interviews, Kimball was very evasive. But one thing he did was he told a story he had not told before. When he's questioned about Casey going missing, he tells the police that Casey had OD'd and she had died on national forest land. He won't tell them where, but he just tells them it was national forest land that she died on and that apparently is where her body is. In April 2007, they go out to search a forest that was in close proximity to where Casey went missing because uh, they're just assuming like this could possibly be the forest that he's talking about. As soon as they get to the forest, a forest ranger comes up to them and tells them that a hunter had found a human skull in the forest not that long ago. So they do DNA testing on the skull and find out that it is Casey. And this is the point where Lori learns that her daughter had been dead and decomposing very close to where she went on her honeymoon and it it just breaks my heart I mean losing your daughter would be devastating enough but to then find out that the guy who killed her you married and went on a honeymoon and you were close to her body like it's just 
it's a different level of sick. It's just absolutely, ugh, I just, my heart just breaks for that woman. It just breaks for her. I couldn't imagine dealing, ugh, I can't even imagine. So the police offer Kimball a deal. If he will show them where the four bodies are, they will, he'll spend the rest of his life in prison, but he won't get the death penalty. He'll only be charged for manslaughter, but because there's so many of them, he'll, he won't get out of jail. He just, he won't get the death penalty, but he has to show them where the four bodies are. So he decides he's going to show them three of the bodies. And then when they get to um, one of the bodies, he decides... I'm just going to kind of send them on a wild goose chase. And he's telling them here, there, and everywhere. And they cannot find this body. The police realize he's just playing games. Uh, so anyways, Kimball tries to just be an asshole about the whole situation. He ends up getting 70 years in prison. And he will die in prison. Which, good. Kimball, once he's in prison, he later claims that he killed dozens of people. And the FBI, they know that he's committed more crimes than the crimes that he was caught for. Because there's large time periods in Kimball's life where nobody knows where he was living or what he was doing. And also, the people that he killed, that he got caught for, he had a personal connection to all of them. So if he was to say, kill someone who he had no personal connection with and nobody knew he was living where that person was, he could very easily have gotten away with a lot of other murders. There's two murders specifically that the FBI are 100% convinced that Kimball committed those two murders. They just don't have enough evidence to convict him of those two particular murders. But he's going to die in prison. So after the whole thing is said and done, the FBI's like, mm, I think maybe we need to do an investigation as to how this happened. And there was one particular FBI agent whose job it was to keep an eye on Kimball and also he's the one that should have known about the charges that he was awaiting trial for, for his first wife for kidnapping and R-wording her. So they suspend him for three months. He appeals and then he gets one week suspension. So... He, he missed a week of work for all of the mistakes that he made. So, uh, okay. And another interesting fun fact, Kimball likes to refer to himself as Hannibal. Okay, Kimball. So that is today's story. I hope that you found it interesting. It was probably extremely frustrating. I was extremely frustrated <laughs> looking into it and how it, anyways, it was a mess, but that's the story. So I really appreciate you guys being here. You guys mean so much to me. Thank you so much for subscribing, for sharing the videos, for liking, commenting, and all those magical, wonderful things you do. I hope you all have an absolutely amazing day and I will see you next week.